evening, everybody. Uh, it's wonderful to see you here after the two years where we had to cope only with streaming, but we had to cope only with streaming activities and online events and so on. It's wonderful to have a public here again at the Kreisky Forum. So I say welcome to everybody who braved the rain and came out here tonight. <clears throat> we are having a, a very distinguished visitor and we are going to discuss some very big issues of our time. I mean, to say that we are going through a danger, difficult, even dangerous times, maybe an, an, uh, an understatement of the day. I mean, times are very unsettling. Yes, things are happening all over uh, that are extremely troublesome, from war to attacks on democracy to rise of, of authoritarianism to pandemics. I mean, there are lots of issues that are coming together that are <clears throat> uh, deeply troubling and where we are trying to bring perhaps some sense into it. Our guests today, and I say particular welcome, Jan Buruma. Uh, he is not the first time here. He has been here several times before, uh, an old acquaintance of the Kreisky Forum, a very distinguished writer, uh, university professor, prolific uh, writer, many books, many articles, and uh, for uh, born in the Netherlands, lived all over the world, long, many years in, in Asia, in Japan, in China, uh, but uh, finally uh, ended his professional career as professor at Bard University in New York. Uh, we have chosen as title for this event War on the West, uh, because it was the title of a recent article Jan Buruma published in the Project Syndicate. And we thought that this would be a very good starting point into our discussion, uh, leading into many different angles of uh, the problematic situation that we, are, that we are confronted with today. So I would, First of all, uh, like uh, Jan Muruma, uh, to tell us a little bit about, sort of, uh, to reflect a little bit about the, sort of the main point of, of this article, and then we lead the discussion from there. Yeah. Yeah, one of the problems um, when you um, write a lot of articles to make a living is that you kind of forget what you wrote um, after a while. and. Um, I know that I wrote this article, but I can't remember exactly what I said. But I'm sure I do you remember. The <laughs> well, I, I do remember um, what uh, why I chose uh, the title "War on the West," and it was because there's a famous book, famous although pretty much forgotten everywhere. It was once famous called "War on the West," and it was by uh, a Hungarian, um, originally. <coughs> Uh, Jewish uh, Hungarian, I think from Budapest, who moved to England in the 1930s. He was a philosopher called Orel Kolnai. And he became a Catholic and rather conservative, um, although not right wing. And he wrote this book in 1937. And it was, he did us all a great service because he plowed through all the writings by right wing intellectuals, in, mostly in Germany and, and Austria. Uh, of the 1920s and early 30s, who were not necessarily Nazis, but people who, who laid the basis uh, for what the Nazis later did. So people like Müller von den Bruck and so on. And uh, he called it War on the West because of a lot of nationalist uh, writing during World War I, including by Thomas Mann, um, where uh, there was a contrast made between the West, which was basically uh, identified with Britain, the United States, and France. And they were liberal, they were open to immigrants, uh, they had a very loose sense of national identity, uh, they were um, 
from the point of view of these people who wrote these things. They were materialistic, uh, only interested in money, uh, etc. And uh, the East, in their view, uh, were the people who understood the values of Blutenboden and who had a spirit and a national soul and so on and so forth. Um, and, where, uh, and this was particularly strong in, in World War I and then, of course, became very popular in the 1920s and, and 30s and then in its extreme form uh, became a national socialist. And I've, I was very impressed when I first read this book because it made a lot of sense because what he was really describing was not so much the West as it is, uh, because the West is many things. I mean, it's conservative, liberal, tolerant, intolerant, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But it, 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 it described, through the eyes of its enemies, um, a, an idea of the West. And uh, an idea of the West that was associated with liberalism, with um, free market economy, with uh, very often, uh, of course, Jews. And um, when um, Avishai Margalit, uh, the Israeli um, philosopher and myself, wrote a book called Occidentalism, uh, and that was called, the subtitle was The West Seen Through the Eyes of Its Enemies, it was widely misunderstood uh, by people who assumed that what we were, and even people who much approved of the book, I think often for the wrong reasons, who assumed that what we were talking about was the West as some existing geographical, cultural phenomenon, and uh, people from the Middle East and Asia and, and, and so on, which was, of course, not our intention. It was to describe a particular idea of the West um, um, and, and the people who hated it so much that they wanted to commit violence. And I think what, I, what this article refers to is that that idea of the West is once again um, in danger and um, being very much squeezed, as was the, true, of course, in the 1920s in Europe, being squeezed between left-wing anti-liberalism as well as right-wing anti-liberalism. When I was when I was looking at your uh, list of applications in bibliography, I uh, found and and I was interested in one of the the books that you had published with the title Year Zero, 1945, right. and uh, it 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 caused me to think because in a, in a way, I have the feeling that we are now again in some kind of zero year, yeah a year which is a sort of a turning point in so many respects. And 1945 was the starting point for a development in a very positive direction. Multilateralism, uh, international institutions, democratization, human rights regimes, some kind of rule of law and a system of global governance that uh, served the whole world very well. And now, uh, at the moment, we have uh, arrived in a situation where <clears throat> this may be the starting point of a big unraveling, where all these uh, achievements are put into question, where multilateralism uh, is, is put in question, international institutions are ignored or under attack, human rights, democracy, I mean, things are going in backwards in a way. Yes, I, I agree with you, but I don't think it started this year. I think it's becoming perhaps more dramatic, but it, that unraveling started earlier, I think. And the reason it was, so, was relatively positive in 1945, which was, was not a particularly positive time for most people to live through, but it was still full of hope, was because what came before couldn't have been worse. And so the shock of World War II and what had happened and the, wreck, the wreckage of Europe and China and East Asia and so on meant that people felt that, well, this never again. And so we have to build institutions that make sure that that kind of catastrophe can't occur again. And that led to, indeed, a kind of consensus between sort of moderate conservatives and social democrats. I mean, the left and the right both uh, 
felt that um, it was a good thing to build a world where this would no longer be possible. And so indeed, uh, multilateral institutions, um, beginning of European unification. I mean, one uh, thing when I researched that book that struck me very much was that um, I came across in the, in, in the library uh, a magazine um, that may not exist anymore, um, but it was a magazine written and edited by American GIs for American soldiers. It was a magazine called Yank. And the articles in this magazine, Yank, uh, were way to the left of the Democratic Party today um, in terms of racial um, relations, in terms of, of rights and human rights, and economic equality, and so on. So this is an illustration of that the whole world was then sort of going in a left-wing, direct, moderate left-wing uh, direction. And I think what kept, in some ways, kept that alive, perhaps perversely, is the Cold War. Because in order to counter uh, communist propaganda, which was in, in the f late 40s and 50s still quite um, influential in intellectual circles, certainly in countries like France and Italy, um, the West or the Western democracies needed to have some idea, some um, common goal uh, of egalitarianism. I mean, that you can't allow societies to get to, too divided between left and right and so on. You had to, there had to, had to be a counter narrative to the communist world that showed that the, the, the capitalist Western world could also be egalitarian. And I th think one of the unintended consequences of the end of the Soviet empire uh, in 1990, 91, was that that ideal was very quickly jettisoned and because people felt it was no longer really necessary. It could all be left to the free market now. And that, of course, also was not, had a, an earlier history. It really began with, in the period of Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan, when uh, there was a reaction to too much union power um, uh, and, and a resurgence of a certain kind of nationalism um, a, a, a kind of fetishism of the free market and so on, which in those days was very much something that came from Britain and America but had an influence uh, in other Western democracies. And after the fall of the Soviet empire, really became not everywhere in the same, to the same extent, certainly not to the same extent in Austria or Germany or France than it did in the United States or Britain, but it sort of became the consensus and this is, of course, what now people call neoliberalism. Um, and when the common ideal of egalitarianism was thrown away, to, to, make it, to put it in a way that's a little bit of a caricature, um, the left lost, lost its purpose. And when the left lost, lost its purpose and conservatism and free market fetishism sort of became the mainstream, I think that did great damage to liberal democracy. And um, what we see now, um, the rise of right-wing populism, um, the Trump administration, uh, and so on, wouldn't have happened if there, had, if there had still been a strong left. So it's not just the rise of the right that needs to be explained, it, what also needs to be explained is the the, the, the demise or the crash uh, of the left. And we can talk about that too. But, uh. I think we should, yes. <laughs> but, uh, I, I, I mentioned this, uh, exa uh, example of the year, uh, year zero uh, because in, in a way it seems to me that the, the war that we are facing now in Europe, uh, Russia's attack on, on Ukraine, uh, is a change of paradigm. Yeah? And we have, we have uh, for, the, for the whole uh, sort of post-war period, it was one of the, the, the dogmas that you do not attack another country. Yeah? And we have uh, the whole system that we built up around this principle. OSCE, Organization of Security Cooperation in Europe, Helsinki, uh, 
process and so it was based on, on, on that, that you do not change borders with, with military violence, that you respect uh, the sovereignty of, of other countries. And in, in a way, uh, this, uh, this attack has crystallized in a way so many things uh, or brought clearer so many things that were already there, which of course you you rightly said, and uh, I've uh, I, I I sometimes think that uh, I mean we have overcome the Cold War in its classical form, yeah, so sort of the West against the old Soviet Empire and uh, and and the, the countries that were under under communist control and rulers. Uh, and leadership, but we are moving into a Cold War in a different, uh, a different composition in a way. Yes, the countries countries are. It's more sort of now the countries that are embracing capitalist market economy, but combine it with authoritarian rule and doing are doing quite well with it. And, uh, and of course, for many, this is a very at attractive concept that you, you are successful, uh, you accumulate wealth, you offer social services, but you don't have to deal with freedom of information, human rights, and, and all these other issues. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a concept that appeals in, in, in many parts of the world. And uh, that's, I, I, I think, the new confrontational lines that we are, we are facing. Yes, I think that's true. I mean, we shouldn't forget, of course, that the I mean, tanks, Soviet and East German tanks, rolled into uh, Hungary and, and Prague and so on yeah, before. Right there, yes. uh, there were war wars in the Balkans as well. So it's not, not completely unprecedented. Um, well, the, I think the, in response to your remarks, I would say two things. One is that, uh, yes, we seem to be uh, facing a very new world and paradigms shift and so on and so forth. On the other hand, uh, you can't help seeing how long the shadow of World War II still is. First of all, both the Russians uh, and some people um, who are supporting Ukraine are claiming to be fighting Nazis. I mean, the, the Russians claim they're fighting Nazis in the Ukraine. Uh, some supporters of the Ukraine uh, sort of project uh, Putin as, uh, as a Hitler and that we're supporting the Ukraine is like fighting the, the, the Third Reich. You see a split, in, uh, an old split, going right through Europe of uh, Britain and America um, being most vociferous and most hawkish about um, fighting Russia and helping Ukraine and so on, blaming uh, Macron because he keeps trying to talk to Putin and blaming Olaf Scholz, Scholz for being uh, uh, too slow to uh, support Ukraine and seeing them as sort of appeasers. So you get the old divisions that were already there in World War II. And, um, and what, it, only, it only shows that you, it's very difficult to escape history, even when things look so new. The other thing I would say is that you're, I think you're absolutely right that um, this model of um, authoritarian capitalism um, is a new challenge. And it was a challenge that was not posed by the Soviet Union, because the Soviet Union was not seen as a, as a, real, as a serious economic competitor. Um, the West didn't do business uh, of any scale with the Soviet Union. And it was a relatively weak and, and poor country. I mean, they had nuclear bombs and so on, but it was, it, it was not a uh, serious economic force. Um, I would say the pioneers of this model uh, are not in Europe, but it's China. Of course. And uh, the model for China uh, is Singapore. And uh, Singapore is a small city state, so it's easy to have a kind of um, authoritarian system with democratic tra trappings, which is still basically uh, capitalist. But uh, Deng Xiaoping, when he opened the door to China for international business and wanted to introduce a kind of capitalism while retaining uh, the monopoly on power um, by the Communist Party, Singapore was really the model 
Uh, and, they, and in Singapore, they pretended uh, in a self-serving way, or Lee Kuan Yew did, that this was somehow uh, natural to Asians. And in Singapore, they talk about Asians because they don't want, if they say the Chinese, then they discriminate against the Malay min minority. So they can't say that this is a Chinese culture, but it, it, it's, they call it Asian. In any case, they um, uh, abuse the notion of Chinese civilization, of Confucianism, and pretend that this is uh, that obeying authority and uh, and so on is somehow the natural cultural thing. Um, but what they've come up with uh, is a hybrid between Chinese authoritarianism based on, an, I think, an abuse of history um, by invoking Confucianism and Chinese culture and what used to be called Asian values and so on, and capitalism. And of course it works up to a point. Um, it's, I think people un underestimate its inherent weakness, which is that the uh, claim to legitimacy the, or the legitimacy of monopolizing political power by the Communist Party is not based on Marxist ideology or Maoist ideology because even communists in China don't believe that anymore. So it's based on the idea of order, of national greatness, and promising the educated urban middle class that they will continue to become more prosperous. Now that's a very risky um, and, and slippery basis for political legitimacy because it means that as soon as the urban middle class are not le no longer becoming more prosperous, but in a serious crisis might even see their savings disappear, political legitimacy um, will be challenged. And in a democracy, you can vote the party out that you blame for this, not in a, in a, in a, a dictatorship. But, I mean, but they are the model, and, and clearly a lot of authoritarian leaders uh, around the world find this attractive because it means that people become your friends and family and m more people than that, a uh, particular class of educated people can be relatively prosperous and yet you hang on to um, authoritarian power. But how far that... Uh uh, the control, the rigid control of the population goes. We have just seen now in a very vivid example with the lockdown of Shanghai and the partial lockdown of, of course, in Beijing uh, as a, a consequence of the corona infections. Yeah, And I think it was, I remember one of the most horrifying pictures of, of that whole thing was from Shanghai where you had uh, so totally empty streets and the only thing that was moving was a little robot uh, dog who was walking the streets and uh, announcing curfew to the people. No people. Not only announcing the, curfew, they had loudspeakers yeah. saying contain the, f the freedom of your, in your oh, heart. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes, it was very and, chilling. And the consequences for the whole... So for global economy, supply lines, transport, uh, and so are horrendous. Yes, absolutely, and it shows the, the, the weakness of, of an autocratic government like that, that yeah. once you've dictated a certain policy, it's very difficult to change. First of all, you can't get voted out, and secondly, you feel that it's, it, it's a challenge to your uh, authority um, if you... Uh, suddenly embark on a different policy. So it's, the, the other thing, I mean, the, the, telling people to contain the freedom in their heart, of course, is, is an interesting slogan. I, I, I'm, I'm paraphrasing. I think it was something slightly different. But it, it's something that Maoists would never have said because they weren't interested in freedom in people's hearts. They were not interested in freedom at all. They were interested in other things. And um, what, what this model that you, you, you mention of autocratic capitalism does, and it's a very clever model, which is that it allows um, prosperous individuals um, a lot of personal freedom, unlike in Maoism or, or even in the Soviet Union. You can live where you want, you can marry who you want, uh, you can go to nightclubs, you can uh, travel to Europe as a tourist, you can buy a Maserati, you can do all these things, 
Um, and as long as it, but, but the one thing you can't do is organize anything that's not under control of the party. And that means that, that people have no political freedom whatsoever, but they have a lot of personal freedom. And that means that the, 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 the people who do, are relatively well off in these systems will become conservative because they want to hold on to those privileges. And they're frightened of uh, sort of mass movements and, and so on. And, and they're even, you can convince them that democracy is dangerous because it will create disorder and the uneducated masses who are, uh, will uh, cause problems and it'll cause vi create violence and so on. And so if you want to hold on to your nice uh, Volkswagen or, or indeed in some cases Maserati, if you want to hold on to your nice apartments and uh, the order that is guaranteed by the party in order for you to have a nice life, you'd better do as we say. And that's, uh, again, as long as the urban educated classes do, uh, do all right, that's a fairly stable system. It's no longer stable, in my view, uh, when people do not no longer do all right. And so COVID is probably a, is a real problem yeah, for probably. the Communist Party. Right. But I've been saying um, for the last 20 years that the Chinese Communist Party was um, vulnerable and um, they're still there. So I probably overestimated their vulnerability. Uh, we don't have... We don't necessarily have to look at uh, China. I mean, we are also in Europe confronted with the, what you call it, the authoritarian temptation. Yeah? We have uh, Hungary and the Orban government flirting with uh, what they call illiberal democracy, which in my opinion is uh, contradictio in adjecto because the democracy cannot be illiberal, I mean, this uh, doesn't go together. Uh, the, but you have, so you have Turkey, you have uh, so a very authoritarian shift in Poland, and finally, I mean, you have certain phenomena also in the United States that are troublesome in that respect. Yes, I mean, it's, that's complicated because I think the reasons for these illiberal trends are not necessarily the same in each country. Yeah, I mean, I think in, in, uh, in Central Europe, a lot of it is because people were promised after 1989 and 1990, now you will join the EU and you'll be just as prosperous as all those Western Europeans and everything is going to be wonderful and so on. And of course, it didn't turn out that way. And so there's a great resentment of the EU of, of people who promise that and, uh, and, and there's a backlash. Um, people want strong men and, uh, and become nationalistic and so on and so forth. I mean, P Turkey has its own um, problems and I'm not competent to talk about that in any uh, detail. In America, it's a little bit more like Europe, although more dramatic in that, as a consequence, I think, of what we were talking about earlier, the collapse of the left, um, when the mainstream became, uh, just to use that as that jargon word, but um, neoliberal, and things were left up to the market, uh, and uh, there was no real ideological difference or not sufficient ideological difference between what was traditionally more or less left of center or right of center. And you got in more and more countries in Europe, um, what in Holland, where I grew up, is called the purple government. So a sort of social democrat and conservative government being in go parties being in government together. You couldn't really tell them apart anymore. And to a lot of people who felt that they were not benefiting from this, that their salaries were stagnating, that their children were no longer going to be better off than the, than the, than, than the parents, uh, that immigrants were coming in and the elites were blamed for, for um, being more generous to the immigrants than they were to the local population, when the EU was blamed often by national governments for their own self-serving reasons, for all the hardships that people were going through, resentment started bu building. And, and when the resentment uh, was voiced 
uh, by people who felt saw you know immigrants coming to their neighborhoods, who saw uh, their children failing at, at school, who saw their jobs disappearing, and so on. It was very easy to blame it all on the elites. And when you blame in Europe, when you blame it on the elites, you blame it on the EU because that's seen as an, as an elite, elite project. Um, you blame it on the immigrants. You blame it on the left that's supposedly coddling the immigrants. Um, and you end up with, with right-wing populism. And something similar has happened in the United States, but in an even more dramatic form. Uh, in, in America, of course, race plays an even bigger role than it does uh, in Europe. But uh, I blame, I mean, of course, you have to blame the right for exploiting this. But I blame the left too. And I think one of the, the, the big, um, it's difficult to call it a mistake because the, the, these things grow gradually. But one of the, the, the problems of the left in Europe and the United States is that they've let go of class and, and looking after the economic interests of, um, of, of a certain class and more and more replaced it with cultural issues, with gay rights, with gender issues, with multiculturalism, none of which are bad um, causes. I mean, you know, I'm in favor of gay rights and so on. But when that more or less replaces class and economic interests, then you end up in a culture war. And when you end up in a culture war, people who are not on the left feel, uh, start their own cultural war. And um, stressing again, coming back to your first question, um, coming back to Bluten Boden. And uh, so I think the culture war is a disaster for, for democracy or liberal democracy. But uh, we are not, on, not only in the United States, also in Europe, we're in the middle of that controversy. And uh, the question is uh, sort of where do you go from there? Yeah, uh, I mean, in the United States, you have, uh, I think the situation is, is even a bit more difficult perhaps than in Europe because of that two-party system that uh, in, in, in the way politics are handled yeah, mm -hmm. enforces uh, very radical positions on both sides. Yeah? While uh, in, the, in England is an exception, but most of the European countries have multi-party systems which dilute, in a way, a little bit these tensions and, uh, and offer more room for uh, channeling. Uh, that is true, positions. but that has its own weakness, which is, I mean, it, the, 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 the strength of that, as you say, is that you can form a cordon sanitaire against the real, the really radical right parties. You can prevent them from ever becoming part of the government by having coalitions of parties who uh, have very little in common except they want to keep the right out. But that doesn't, that, that's a, a short-term solution. I mean, the, the resentment that drives the far right will only get worse because of that, because it strengthens the feeling we are not only left behind, we're kept out of power or kept down, it's these elites and they have to be, and et cetera. So it's not, I agree with you that in the short term that makes you feel a little bit safer in Europe than it does in, in, in the United States, but it doesn't solve the problem. The, what, what I think would go some way to solving the problem is to go back to economic interests. And I think uh, Joe Biden actually started off on the right note, which was to, he may have been too ambitious, he may not have sold it properly, all that, but I think he had the right idea to uh, try and have a, a, another new deal, which would benefit um, immigrants just as much as um, the local population that was not, that were not doing very well. And so as the, as the you have to, it's no good for, if you're a left-wing party to say, oh, well, we have to be nice to immigrants and we shouldn't be anti-racist and we have to appreciate their, their cultures and we should um, uh, encourage mosques and so on, all of which, none of which are bad things. But I think it would be much better to try and um, uh, point out 
that certain economic policies would benefit immigrants just as much as the local working class, so that you get a, a, a real uh, sense of solidarity between the working class and immigrants. That's hard to do, but you have to try and do that. Whereas what we have now, um, again, you see it in America so clearly, is that the, the poor white people see um, immigrants and black people and so on as enemies, whereas they actually share a lot of problems and have a lot of problems in common. And so you find that poor white people making common cause with a billionaire surrounded by sort of, uh, cronies who, who are extremely rich, uh, doing things to become even richer and selling and, and, and um, uh, uh, persuading uh, these poor whites, or relatively poor whites, that somehow uh, they're benefiting because you're fighting for their culture. But uh, that's, again, a reason why I think the sooner we get away from the culture wars and the more we get back to class and economics, the better. I mean, I was never a socialist uh, in my life. And um, in the 70s and 80s, I sort of slightly reacted against leftists in Europe as a form of rebellion against the, the 68 generation. Having lived in America now for almost 20 years, I've become much more left-wing than I ever was before, but in, a, in the classical sense. I, uh, I, that, that's very nice. It's nice, <coughs> nice to welcome you in the group of, of <laughs> leftist thinkers, especially here in this house. Uh, I, I I was thinking when you, when you spoke about with the, sort of the problems in the multi-party system. Yeah. Uh, I I lived for a couple of years in France, and uh, it was that time when the sort of Father Le Pen was um, sort of on the rise of of, 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 of for, the, for the movement, and uh, uh, in the Parti Socialiste as well as with the Conservative Party, Chirac and so on. This, the dogma was keep them out of power mm. at all costs, and they were they were sacrificing uh, electoral uh, victories. I mean, just to keep out uh, an uh, uh, no, uh, mm -hmm. Le Pen follower, and, so and it didn't work because it. Uh, at the, at the moment, I mean, uh, the movement is with 40% and uh, shows that this, this was not the right answer. Yeah? No, it and doesn't work. I think work. probably yeah. going uh, back to sort of economic issues, basic economic issues, um, might be a more solid uh, so, well, so especially the since the, the far right and, and, the, and the Le Penistes are... are good examples of this, but so is Trump, and rhetorically at least, they've hijacked a lot of the economic issues from the left. So, it, it, I mean, you always, of course, had a distinction between right-wing populism and left-wing populism, and, and, but what they have in common is that they are anti-elitist. But the, the left-wing populists were, of course, against bankers and financers and so on, but so, so is the right. I mean, it's not national socialism for nothing. And so for the, if once the left lets go of uh, those economic issues, it gets hijacked by the right, which is yet another reason why the yeah. left should try and get it back. But that's why it's so tragic that, uh, in a way, Biden failed to bring that uh, big uh, uh, economic revival project that he had with infrastructure and so on, so through, through Congress and, and really get the money to do it. Well, um, he got, he got, I mean, he, he still got more yeah. through than, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but more through than either, uh, certainly Trump or even Obama did. I mean, Obama got, got the health care through. Yeah. But um, one shouldn't underestimate what Biden has actually achieved. I mean, it's, he's not really given cre enough credit, I think. There was yesterday uh, an article by Thomas Friedman in the New York Times. He's not my guru. I don't see. <laughs> <laughs> so he's not everybody's guru. But, but nevertheless, he, he's, he, uh, it was a very personal kind of, uh, sort of commentary that he wrote about the lunch that he had with Biden. 
Yeah, that was him as, at his worst. Mm -hmm. When he gets p personal, that's rarely when he's irritating. But no, but, the, but the, he then, he then uh, concluded the article by saying that uh, sort of Biden uh, was successful in sort of keeping NATO together. He was successful in keeping Europe together. He was successful in keeping the West together. But that uh, he is very concerned that he was not keeping the United States together and that uh, the, the, the breaking lines and the, the fissures in the, in the society well, that, yeah, are that, so great. That goes to show moment. that he's a master of the cliché. Um, <laughs> and, and, but the main point of these articles is to say that he had lunch with President Biden and, <laughs> and, he had the and Biden, Biden listened to his advice. But, uh, and he had the tuna sandwich. They had a tuna sandwich too. <laughs> No, but I, th I, I, I mean, on a more serious note, I think that the, one of the biggest problems that the United States is facing is this constant uh, uh, attack on voting rights and the, the fooling around with the electoral system. Uh, I remember when I, was, when I was still in Washington, I met members of Congress who were proud that in their whole political life they never had an opponent because it was so, the majorities were so solidified that they were re-elected and re-elected and re-elected and there was never a question of a political shift. And if you have uh, a, a parliament, and Congress is after all a parliament too, uh, where only 10% of the seats can be changed in an election, uh, this puts a quick question mark whether this is really sort of a bona fide democratic system. Yes, of course, both parties do this. Yes. Um, and, and some of the oldest democracies, I mean, Britain um, particularly, have had these kind of practices forever. I mean, you had the so-called rotten boroughs and, um, and corruption has always been there. I'm, I'm less worried about corruption than I am about a direct attack on uh, democratic institutions and democracy itself. I mean, what, what should have disqualified um, Donald Trump from the beginning was when he said, I think in the first presidential debate, may have been in the second one, but I think the first one, and he was asked the question, would he accept uh, the outcome of the election uh, and he said, well, that depends on what the outcome is. And that should have disqualified him. I mean, you, you cannot be a president in a liberal democracy if you're not prepared to accept electoral defeat. Yes. And if you're not prepared to accept electoral defeat, the, the, the system won't work. And uh, that's much more dangerous. I mean, it's bad enough, all the... Uh, uh, the um, fooling around with electoral districts and that kind of gerrymandering. But it's, it's really catastrophic when you manage to uh, convince a large number of people who vote for one of the main, two main political parties that the outcome of an election is illegitimate. Because if you say that, then the whole system is illegitimate. Yeah, but that's why you have the sort of Damocles is a big lie. Yes. But it's still hanging or poison but, but in the political debate. But uh, when you if were you saying... so many, such sure. a high percentage of, of, of the population that is still, even today, convinced that uh, the, the election of Biden was illegitimate and uh, that it was only by uh, fraud uh, mm. and so uh, that, uh, that poisons the political system completely. Of course. No, absolutely. So I, th I think, I mean, you were saying uh, democracy can't exist without liberalism. That depends on what you mean by democracy. I mean, you, you, the, some people on the far right um, believe uh, that uh, real democracy is direct democracy with referendums and that kind of thing. That's when you get the, the voice of the people. And whereas liberal democracy is, is a variation. I mean, it, well, we all know this. I mean, it, it's representative and... Uh, and so on. And you can have a lot of corruption and fooling around, and the liberal democracy can survive that, but not if 
um, half the voters don't believe the system works. We are also having an occasional debate about uh, sort of uh, uh, politics by referendum and, and, and uh, sort of the Volksmeinung here. Yeah? And, and, uh, uh, but we are still holding on to the representation of democracy and representation mm -hmm. system. Uh, it works in Switzerland, but it's the only country that yeah. I know where this kind of political system really works and where people are very serious about what they are doing yes. yeah? and not influenced by political populist maneuvering or less influence than anybody else. But I, I to, to go back to sort of our, our more uh, perhaps burning issue at the moment is the relationship between Europe and the United States per se. Uh, and uh, it was, uh, we came in a way through the Trump years, yeah, with a lot of problems and a lot of uh, uh, misgivings on both sides and, and misunderstandings and so on. Biden has straightened it out to a certain extent, yeah, and we are back. And in a way, Friedman is right that he said he, Biden has kept uh, uh, us together in the trans-Atlantic uh, trans relationship. Uh, but we are having uh, midterm elections now, uh, in two years presidential elections, and if all predictions are taken seriously, there's a, it's not unlikely that Mr. Trump will have, uh, will, will have a return to power? Well, first of all, I don't think we should take predictions seriously because we just don't know. I mean, the, the, the politics, I mean, I don't want to sound like um, I have to Friedman, but... You. It was in this house that Shimon Peres once said, uh, and that's a remarkable sentence, he said, uh, opinion polls are like perfume. Uh, they smell nice, but don't drink them. Right. Exactly. So we don't know. I mean, we don't know whether Trump will be the candidate. Uh, all kinds of things can still happen. But the President of the United States is an immensely powerful figure. And um, uh, it, it is indeed possible that he could come back. And that would, again, challenge all those things that Biden has been trying to uh, put together. Um, there's no, no question. And you already see uh, in different parts of the world uh, countries anticipating this. Um, in uh, um, East Asia, for example, um, there was the, the, because of the war in the Ukraine, uh, the Taiwanese, among others, are getting very anxious that China might be tempted to do something similar. They didn't really take their defense terribly seriously like everywhere else, the young, young people that would much prefer to have fun than to um, be conscripted into the army. Um, and uh, they're beginning to v change their, this very fast, and they're talking about having, a cons uh, having conscriptions, uh, conscription again. Um, but uh, there was an opinion poll, and for the first time, less than 50% of the Taiwanese population thought that America would come to their rescue in, ca in the case of a, a Chinese invasion. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is because of Trump. People realize that if Trump comes back, things could g go very uh, badly wrong again. And in some ways, it's a necessary wake-up call, in my view. I mean, it's, it, it, it's a very harsh and dangerous and risky wake-up call, but it was a necessary one. Because, again, to go back to 1945, the deal behind the world order that was created then at least in the non-communist world, was the United States will take care of our security, whether you were Japanese or Dutch or Austrian or, 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 or British. Um, the United States will take care of our, our security. We don't have to worry about that too much. We can concentrate on rebuilding our economies and being prosperous and wealthy and so on. And that made us all sort of into, uh, into adolescence that we resent the dependence on our father and we want to kick him in the shin at every opportunity. And uh, this is not a healthy situation, especially now that most Europeans are most, more prosperous than most Americans. 
So it's also not for nothing, and Trump understood this very well, that many Americans can be talked into feeling resentful that their tax dollars go into um, paying for uh, uh, protecting Europeans and Japanese and Koreans and so on, even though those people being protected are not pulling their weight and um, um, uh, are dependent on this. And um, f again, for a good liberal democracy to function, there has to be a certain sense of responsibility for your own security. You can't be completely dependent on the United States forever. This is not a good situation. And it could be that Trump and now Ukraine has woken up uh, Europeans and, some, and East Asians sufficiently that they will take seriously uh, this idea of paying more for our defense, for being more um, independent. Uh, we can't cut ourselves off, ourselves off from the United States, certainly not yet. But to be, it'll, it, it'll be very difficult, but it's absolutely essential that Europeans start thinking seriously about, about this. And, and by Europeans, I mean in, in particular the Germans. Because without Germany, nothing will really change. And so, um, having grown up in the Netherlands uh, only a few decades after the war, it very, feels very peculiar to be saying this, but you know, I want Germany to become a more serious military power again. Um, I would never thought I would think that when I was uh, younger, but I really do. And I think it's, it's, it's a real problem that, I mean, it's changing now. And, and the uh, attitude of the Greens uh, in this war is very, very interesting. Very interesting. So uh, things are beginning to change. And I think in, in, for very bad reasons, war and so on, but that is perhaps one positive aspect, that it's made countries that were too dependent on the United States think a little bit more responsibly. In, in a way, uh, Trump was the first wake-up call in that respect. And uh, when, when he said and came out with statements like, sort of Europe is an enemy and, and NATO is obsolete, and uh, that was a shock uh, in, for, for Europe. And in, in some respects, a very healthy shock, because we, we started to confront these issues. And uh, as, a, as a consequence of the, the present war situation, uh, the security debate you know, in Europe has become much more stronger. And it was always there. Mm. And, and uh, as you know, I mean, things in the European Union particularly move very slowly and go in phases and, and so on. But uh, uh, it, uh, the, the basis has been laid Yes. for a common European security system, common European defense. It will take time I mean, until it all materializes. And, and how serious that whole issue is taken at the moment, you see but a sudden switch in, in the Nordic yes. defense position where Sweden and Finland uh, seek entry into NATO after generations and generations of, of non-alignment and then being alliance free. Uh, and we have the same debate here in Austria about what is, are we still uh, keeping on as a neutral country? Is this uh, a concept which is conducive to our, our security or do we have to change it? I mean, so the debate is ripe. And uh, uh, as, as you said, should, should it turn out that Trump comes back into the presidency, it, it will get another push. It's, it's one more reason why Brexit was such a disaster, because you can't conceive of any kind of European security, common security uh, arrangement uh, without Britain. I mean, Britain and France are the only countries that have any, uh, not, not nearly serious enough, but any, uh, uh, at least some kind of serious defense. And um, uh, without Britain, it can't be done. And what, again, politics are being played in this Ukraine war in that Boris Johnson, who likes to posture as the sort of Churchill of his time, which makes it, him look pretty absurd. But um, 
one of the, th the ways he does it is by grandstanding in uh, Kiev um, and other places and uh, projecting this image, which is not entirely wrong, of that once again it's the English-speaking countries and now with the Scandinavians who are standing up for freedom against a dictator and so on, whereas the Germans and the French and they still want to talk and pretend that you know, everything can be done peaceful in a peaceful way and so on. All these are caricatures, but uh, there's a kernel of truth to it. And so the more Britain is integrated into, into the EU, and one can only hope that after Boris Johnson and the Brexiteers, Britain will come to its senses and they'll come to some kind of, if not rejoin, at least to some a better, a closer arrangement. Uh, because without that, I don't see much hope. Well, in, in, in many different respects, Brexit was a disaster. It was very detrimental for the European Union, but it's also, I mean, a disaster for Britain. Uh, I, I remember that you had, uh, not so long ago, an article in Project Syndicate uh, about the relationship, uh, about the consequences of Brexit and the relationship between the United States and... Uh, and, uh, the, and, and Britain, called the Church, well, the, church the Churchill Complex was a book, and, and it's. Oh, it's I was trying to argue yeah. that that um, in some ways, uh, I mean, in, many, in almost every respect, it was a very good thing that uh, the Allies won the war, um, and Austria was the first victim of uh, Nazi Germany, but um, it had its it it, it had its unfortunate consequences, which is that uh, it, Britain stuck to the United States like a leech instead of playing a major role uh, in, in the EEC and then the EU because it, it hung on to its hour of glory um, and thought that by sticking to the United States it could still be a, a, a major power and that the, the national glory uh, was had the great national glory was having defeated uh, Nazi Germany and Japan and, and, and the United States in particular, but usually followed by Britain loyally, embarked on a lot of stupid wars because presidents tended to see themselves, wanted to be Churchill and not Attlee, or not um, uh, Chamberlain. And so uh, the two countries in some ways suffered from having been the victors in World War II. Whereas uh, in Germany, of course, the consequences was, was very different. Uh, there they still suffer because they feel that they can just concentrate on um, being prosperous and having a good life and talking about peace and love without having to be responsible for their security and being frightened of it. So uh, again, it shows how historical events um, shape the future and how difficult it is to get away from those the, those events. I mean, Austria's um, neutrality or carefully cultivated neutrality, no doubt, has a lot to do with Austria's um, history Certainly. in the 20th century. Certainly, it was the result of uh, it, it was uh, neutrality that brought back sovereignty, mm -hmm. independence. Uh, uh, separated Austria from the German question right. and got the foreign troops out of the country. Yes. And in a way then uh, it went through several phases which uh, uh, we, we do not uh, get into that discussion right. here now. Right. Uh, but uh, at, at the moment we are in the situation that about uh, close to 90% of the population are deeply attached to the status of neutrality. Yeah. And it's very difficult to well, it's a very comfortable. Any other, it's any a very comfortable context. situation to yeah. be in. Yeah. Which uh, which does not mean that we have not played our role also, modest as it is, in the building up a European security system. We are members of PESCO, and we are uh, sending troops. We are still in the Balkans, and so so we do a modestly, but uh, nevertheless, we're doing our share. Yeah. But uh, in the, also in the, in the, in the, the broader picture, 
of the whole transatlantic relationship, as, which is extremely solid, if you look at it, uh, purely the economic issues. Yeah? Uh, when you, the, there's nothing, there's no other economic relationship which is as strong as the relationship between the United States and Europe in every respect, that's trade, that's foreign direct investment, uh, jobs, uh, whatever, whatever uh, aspect you look at. Uh, but, uh, but in every other respect, I mean, the, the role of Britain in that, in that relationship was instrumental over the years. And uh, in, in a way that Britain broke out of the European Union and, and the consequences of Brexit also in this relationship are, are felt. Yes, that's true, but it, it, one can also overrate uh, the b role of Britain in this, in that Britain took the relationship with America much more seriously than America took the relationship with Britain. I mean, there are, there, there are certainly, uh, there's a lot of com cooperation in intelligence and that kind of thing left over from the war, and, and this, you know, it's, they speak a similar language and all that, all the rest of it. But uh, from quite a long time ago, I mean, uh, President Kennedy still confided in Harold Macmillan and saw him as a sort of father figure and uh, was an Anglophile of a kind, perhaps as a form of rebellion against his father who was an Anglophobe. But from Johnson onwards, really, the Americans took Germany probably more seriously than Britain. Germany was the major power in Europe, not Britain. I mean, there was nostalgia and, you know, the Ronald, Re Ronald Reagan and Donald Trump, and are they like going horse riding with the Queen and all that kind of thing? But um, that's not serious. And I think when the Americans were serious, and that was true, think of after the Gulf, I think it was after the Gulf War, the first capital in Europe that um, George H. W. Bush visited was not Britain, it was, it was Bonn still at the time. And so Germany was considered to be the major power and the Americans wanted Britain always to be the kind of the, the middleman, uh, wanted Britain to be in Europe as the sort of the country that understood America best and, and all that. But um, apart from Donald Trump, for his own perverse reasons. And no American president would have condoned, certainly not Ronald Reagan either, um, Britain leaving uh, European institutions in the way they did. But um, so um, I think it's probably done the most damage to Britain itself, Brexit that is, but in, a ter in terms of security, um, it's, uh, well, in economics too, but it's certainly done a lot of damage to, the, to Europe as well. Yes. yes. I, can, uh, I can cite you one example where Europeans have become very resentful of the special relationship between Britain and the United States, and that was in Washington, where the British Embassy and its uh, diplomats had special passes which enabled them to go into the State Department without any security checks and, and sort of complete free access and free movement, while the rest of us always had to apply appointment, wait, security check up, and, and so forth. So there was a lot of, of yeah. grumbling here about the special relationship. I wonder if that's still true today. I'd, I'd, be, I'd be slightly surprised. No, I, mean, I think that's... Um, but yeah, there are those yeah. perks. And, but but uh, they're, they're, they sort of feel a bit like you know, Ronald Reagan riding his horse with the Queen. I mean, there, <laughs> there are these nostalgic leftovers. But the, the relation, I don't think the relationship was, for a long time has been taken very seriously by Washington. I mean, the, the language. I mean, for, for example, um, uh, Obama wrote a book, and I can't remember the title now, not about his, his own background and, and so on, but he wrote a book about foreign policy in which Britain is only mentioned once. And uh, so uh, 
it's especially the British themselves rarely overrate, I think, the importance yeah. of this special no, relationship. I, I would agree, and I think uh, at, uh, now uh, even uh, the American politicians know that they have to go to Brussels mm. if they want anything in Europe. And Biden has been doing that very well, and Anthony Blinken as well. Well, it was Kissinger who said that the problem with Europe is that you he didn't know who to call. Number, the famous phone number. Yeah, yeah. and, and so, meantime, they know. so that often went through London, and that's no longer true. But I don't think that the problem is so severe anymore. I mean, I think they do know who to call. They and, uh, don't know who to call, and they don't know where to go. And, yes. and the first call is usually to the German Chancellor. Yeah. Uh, I think we should open the discussion a little bit to our audience and I see already a lot of interest. Yes. Can